Good morning, River Church. How are you all this morning? <laughs> a little sleepy, but we'll get there. Um, good morning. My name is Daniela, and I just have a few announcements before we carry on with today's service. Um, if this is your first time with us, we're so glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us. Um, we just have a few quick announcements just for you. You should have received a connection card that looks like this. Um, if you did not receive one, we do have them over there on the welcome table. Um, we would love to just get some information from you, just have a way to follow up with you. And then after the service ends, if you will take that card and take it over to the welcome table, Pastor Randy and his wife Lydia would love to personally welcome you to the church and give you a special gift. So fill it out, hang on to it, and then take it to the welcome table after the service. For everyone else, your connection card is a great way to submit a prayer request, uh, talk about a need that you may have, the leaders of this church would love to know how to specifically pray for you, and you can do that right here on the bottom. So fill that out and drop it in the offering containers as they go by later on. Um, if you remember from last week, um, we are taking a pause on our um, like weekly events as we go through the month of December. So if you um, remember, we do not have prayer gathering on Tuesday, and we do not have community nights on Wednesday. Um, but we do have something really special coming up, which is our Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve. So if you are trying to make your plans with your families, trying to figure out what you're going to do during the Christmas holiday, we would love to have you for um, the service on that day. So mark your calendars for that. For the rest of the announcements, I have Pastor Randy taking it over. Daniela, what is that on your hand? I don't know if y'all heard, but Daniela and Michael got engaged just like a few days ago. Yay. I haven't even seen you since you did, so congratulations, young lady. Congratulations. Awesome. Another wedding. Liddy and I, when we were driving to, to uh, church today, by the way, I got to drive to church with my whole family today, which is, which is a rare occasion because Pastor Billy's preaching, but we were talking about all the weddings that, we, that I've presided over this year here at River Church and my own daughter's wedding. So, yeah, I don't know. Actually, I don't, I'm assuming I get to marry you. I don't know. You may be, maybe you got some, maybe you have different plans. But anyway, assuming that happens, that there'll be another, another, another wedding. Um, this is uh, the month of December, as you know, and we are branding this month um, the month of giving. And um, I think we have a slide for that. Um, and you may... You may consider that uh, marketing or hokey, but let me tell you why I think it's significant. We have just moved into a month where um, the, the, the culture that we live in, it doesn't know what to do with this idea of being, of, of, of being generous. I mean, I mean, people, not just Christians, people in general, they, they want to be generous. There's, just, there's this want, this desire and especially in the month of December, because even for the unbeliever, there is this sense of Christmas is coming, Christmas is so special, I need time to prepare, right? That's the month of Advent, or that's the, that's the season of Advent. This is week two of Advent. We're looking forward, but like, it's so special, you know, for us, it's the birth of our Lord and Savior, you know. For, for some, it's, you know, Santa Claus is coming to town, but, but it's so special that we want to <clears throat> prepare for it. So if you, watch the, if you watch the commercials on TV, if you watch TV or online, you see how weird that becomes in, in our world. Like where what, like the most extravagant, extravagant thing that you see on TV is like uh, a spouse uh, buys a car without getting his, his or her spouse's permission, right? And all of a sudden there's a car in the driveway. Like I don't know how that would go in your house, but like we tend to talk these things out before we before we do that, right? But that's, that's the world's desire. And I'm not throwing stones because I, I, love, I love our culture. I love our community. I love our neighbors. But that's the world's sort of like, man, we want to be really extravagant. So into that want, that need that's built into us, I want to invite you to be extravagant in your giving toward the church in the month of December. Uh, it's been a beautiful year as we've seen some new faces. We've seen some people that, don't, that haven't been a part of a church for a while come here and be baptized and, 
kind of moving out of COVID. It's been a, it's been a cool year. You know, in the last few months, that finances have been tough here at River Church, and so uh, we, you know, we just went and came, just came into December. Today's December fifth, and so we've got some we've got some uh, financial needs that have gone unmet. Billy and I have been praying regularly and fervently that the Lord would provide. Last month, He did through your good gifts, and so I invite you to consider how the Lord might be calling you to be extravagant in the month of December. Now, some of you have been. You've been, dis- you've been extravagant throughout the year, and I commend you, and I don't want you to feel any undue pressure. There's this ethic in, um, in Paul's writing to the church in Corinth that there, there are moments in time in the church where some people are able to carry the heavy burden, and others just at that moment in time, they can't. And maybe back in November when we were asking you to give extravagantly, maybe that wasn't you. It just weren't there. But maybe now you have that ability. And so now you can step up, you know. There, but, but some of you have been carrying that weight, carrying that. You've been, you've been extravagant throughout the year, and I commend you. And I don't want you to feel any undue pressure. Um, but we do have some, unmet, unmet, some real financial unmet needs, that, that, uh, financially unmet needs that, that we need to address this week. So if that's you, if you're able, I invite you to be uh, an extravagant giver in the month of December. Every year at our Christmas Eve service, we take up a special offering, and we invite you to be generous on that day. But I invite you to not wait till December, till to, to Christmas Eve. I invite you to consider giving your first and your best gift here early in December, um, as as this month plays out, and we 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 attempt to to finish the year financially stable. And that's all I have to say about that. The Lord will lead you. I trust that He will. The Lord has led Lydia and I. We've been giving regularly and been extravagantly this year um, in the plate and electronically and, and, and through payroll deduction. We've been doing that, and I invite you to follow um, Billy, Billy and Elise Pastor Billy and Elise, they, they, set the, they set the pace. Lydia and I set the pace. We invite you to, to follow us in that. Having said that, let us pray and ask that the Lord would, would move in our hearts today. Lord, we come before you today weary from a week of just forgetfulness, a week of trying to do it our own way, a week of, of in some cases, frustration, uh, and we, we need this time together as a church for you to, to reorder or recalibrate our thoughts. We need this time. So we ask that you would, you would speak deeply into our hearts through, Bill, through Pastor Billy, through his sermon, through your word. We will sit and listen, and we want for you to speak clearly into our lives. Lord, if you would do that through Pastor Billy, we'll, we'll celebrate that. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Good? <clears throat> um, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? This is the question that we are often... I'm going to switch the mics. I was, it's a little echoey. Thank you, Randy. <clears throat> Good morning. We had, uh, yeah, we had microphone issues last week. We thought we had it fixed, but we'll get there. Um, so what do I want for Christmas is a new microphone. <laughs> um, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? This is a question that you're asked this time of year. You know, what do you want uh, for Christmas? What are you hoping to get uh, on Christmas morning? I asked my boys this, and you know, I don't even have to ask William, my oldest son. Like, he's that boy, man. He's going to be the end of me and Lisey's savings, right? <clears throat> he is always telling us the things that he wants. Always, always, always. So it's, uh, hey, William, what do you want for Christmas? And he'll tell us. And then we'll ask Matthew, hey, Matthew, what do you want for Christmas? Um, and then William will just answer over Matthew because William has things that he wants. That boy knows exactly exactly what he wants. 
Actually, at this Christmas, I don't think he can hear me. Um, he wants a Nintendo Switch. So, but he made it clear. He's been talking to us about that for months. Daddy, I want to get a Nintendo Switch. Nintendo Switch. I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. But that's the question that we're asked this time of year. What do you want for Christmas? And, and immediately you might be thinking of these uh, materialistic type things. Maybe you are the one that is hoping for a brand new car to be in your driveway, right? Um, <clears throat> And so, so we, have these, we have these hopes, we have these desires of things that we may want. And, and, and as we think about it more, we start to move from the materialistic things, and we start to survey our life and, and scan our life and, and see all the ways that maybe we have been praying to the Lord and, and, and our prayers and our burdens and, and the things that are on our hearts. And we start to hope that maybe, maybe those things will happen uh, this holiday season. Right? We, start to, we start to think of the, the ways that maybe we've been praying for something for a long time and the, the Lord hasn't answered uh, that prayer and, and it's been something that's heavy on our hearts and the Lord hasn't answered that prayer and, and you've been thinking about this Christmas after Christmas after Christmas and the Lord hasn't answered your prayer. Why? Why has the Lord not answered your prayer? It's a, it's a tough question. I'm not the Lord, so uh, I cannot uh, get inside the mind of the Lord, but I, I want to give us some hope today. Okay? I, I want to give us some hope in regards to our prayers, right? There is hope. We're gonna, today we're going to look at a story of a man who spent years praying for something. He was burdened for years for something, and the Lord finally answered his prayer. Our story uh, is found in Luke uh, chapter 1, and it's the story of Zechariah. It's the story of Zechariah in Luke uh, chapter 1, and again, he had spent years, uh, he was already an old man, spent years, and the Lord finally answered his prayer. So we're going to look at the story, the, the story of, of Zechariah. We're going to look at it we're going to learn from it. Uh, we're going to give God the glory through it. So, <clears throat> but before we get in uh, to the passage, uh, there's kind of a, a bit of history, a bit of, of foundation setting that we need to, to, to lay in order to understand what's going on um, in, in, this, in this passage. But the first thing I'd like for us to see, and the first thing uh, that I want you guys to hear is, is as you guys are praying, as you guys have these unanswered prayers, what I want you guys to remember, what I want you guys to know is I want you guys to, to take heart, right? Take heart. Be encouraged. God knows our prayers. He knows our desires. He knows our needs. He knows the things that are burdening our heart. So take heart. The, the Lord God knows our prayers. God knew Zechariah's prayers. Okay, Zechariah is the first story that we read in the Gospel of Luke. Right? Luke gives his introduction. He says, I've written all this stuff. I've studied all the material. I've gotten all the accounts. And I've written this Gospel so you can know with certainty of the events that took place. Right? So that's how Luke starts uh, his gospel, our story is in the gospel of Luke. And then the first story he talks about in the gospel of Luke is not even about Jesus. It's about Zechariah. I think that's, that's an interesting, interesting <clears throat> uh, uh, thing to see. Starts with Zechariah pointing the spotlight on this man. So who, who was this man? Who was Zechariah? He was an old man. He was a faithful man. His story kind of sounds like uh, the Old Testament, uh, Abraham from the Old Testament, just an older, faithful uh, man. Right? Uh, he, he had uh, two prayers, two things that were burdening his heart. And, 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 and well, the first thing that, that, that was burdening his heart uh, had to do with his vocation, had to do with his job. 
Okay, he was a priest. Okay, now a priest in, in the Bible, priest in the in, in the Bible in the Old Testament. These are the people who were um, part of the, the the nation of Israel. They were the Levites, right? And they were the, they were priests. So the, the priests came from the Levites, uh, but they were priests, and they were the people who were in, uh, charged for uh, instructing people on how to live in a godly way. Right? They knew the law, and they knew how to, uh, or, or their job was to instruct people to live accordingly. They knew the sacrifices. They knew what you should do, what you should not do. And, and they were almost like pastors of, of, of the day. Right? Um, to contrast a little bit, prophets, uh, prophets were in the Old Testament. They were usually in charge for calling people back. So people who were wandering away from the faith, they were calling them back to, uh, back to God. So that's a prophet. But a priest was, was, was like a pastor and just preaching and teaching and, and, and sharing the law with the people. The text said that, that Zechariah, as I said, was a faithful man, but it must have been hard. It must have been hard. Uh, um, being a faithful man, given the state of the people during his time. Okay, why, why is that the case? Why is that the case? Right? Uh, as we get into Luke, Luke chapter 1, uh, Luke is written, <clears throat> it is, again, the first, it's a gospel. And so prior to this, prior to this point in time, right, there was 400 years of silence. If you look at your Bible, you go to the Old Testament, then, then to the New Testament, right, there's, uh, I think it's Malachi, then to Matthew, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all Gospels. That gap, that's, it's, it's just one turn of a page, but it's 400, uh, it's about a 400-year period. It's known as the intertestamental period. And, and during these 400 years, the Lord was no longer speaking to, communicating with the nation of Israel, Right? They, the, during this 400 years, they were no longer a, a, a nation, an independent nation, but they were a group of people who were under Roman law, under Roman rule. As a teacher of God's word, as someone instructing people on how to live, it must have been extremely difficult in that context. There's no sign of the Lord working. It must have been hard for him to do his job with confidence. Right? It must have been hard for him to teach people that they're to be a holy nation under God's rule when they were not even a nation and they were under Roman rule. Right? They wanted to be, they were commanded to be a blessing to the nations. But I bet they didn't think that that blessing would be through the taxes that were taken from them, right? The money that was taken from them through taxes. They were to be a people that were devoted to a monotheistic God, one God, but they were living in a culture that was flooded with multiple gods. Speaking to people about God would have been a great idea only if God hadn't stopped speaking to them. This is the context of Zechariah's life. <clears throat> I want to ask us, are we, are we praying for God to move in our culture right now? Are we praying that people come to know Jesus right now? Or do you feel hopeless? Do you feel like it's pointless or hopeless to tell people about Jesus? Is it, is it hopeless to invite people to our Christmas Eve service thinking, man, those people are just, they're never going to come? Do we think that our culture is too far gone? Right? There was recently, it breaks my heart, there was recently a school shooting there was our, our, our political leaders can't seem to see eye to eye on anything. Our moral compass as a culture is backwards. 
What left, what's left is right. What's up is down. You can say what you want to say. You can be what you want to be. Are we looking at our culture and are we asking, man, how did we get here? Are you discouraged to even pray about it because you just feel pretty hopeless about it? Like, man, there's just nothing, there's nothing that can happen. That's, that's what... <clears throat> That's what Zechariah was feeling. On a personal level, on a personal, that was, that was his job, that was him in society, but on a personal level, he seemed to be doing pretty well. Right? He, 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 uh, it says that he walked, he and his wife walked blamelessly uh, with the Lord. He was a, a faithful, faithful person. Right? The Lord said he was faithful. Um, he, he had a, respect, a respectable job, he was a priest. Right? He had a successful marriage. They were faithful. Right? They were the kind of people that I would, that I would, that I would encourage young people who want to get married. Hey, you see, you see Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth? Like, watch what they do. Watch how they serve the Lord and copy them. Right? Do what they do. When I, was a young, when I was a younger Christian, even today really, but I'm always looking at other couples. I'm always looking at other relationships. And Man, how can I grow uh, my love for my wife? How can I grow as a husband with my wife? How can I love my wife like Christ loves the church? And, and, and to help me with that, I look at other couples, right? I look at other godly relationships of people who I respect. I'm like, man, I want to do what they're doing, right? I like the way that their marriage looks. I want my, by God's grace, I want my marriage to look like that. Let me follow those people, right? Zechariah was one of those guys. He and his wife, they were one of those uh, relationships that I would encourage people to follow. But there was something, though, that they wanted that they did, that did, there was something that they wanted that they didn't have, right? They wanted a child, they wanted to build a family, right? I can imagine them, uh, uh, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, looking at other families, looking at other couples, looking at other uh, 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 just husband and wives playing with their kids, running around uh, with their kids. I could see them looking around and, and other people growing their families. I could see Zechariah looking at other Men teaching their kids how to fish, and Zechariah being like, Man, I wish I could teach my own son how to do that. I could imagine Elizabeth watching other mothers nurse their children, right? Man, my wife says whenever she was nursing, that intimate look that the baby has as he's looking into your eyes, it's like, Okay, Elise, what, what am I supposed to do about that? I can't, I can't relate to that, but. That sweet, intimate moment of, of having a child or, or when they're running towards you and like you're the, you're the greatest person in the world and they just put their arms up in the air towards you. They wanted that. They wanted someone to call them mom and dad. Right? Psalm 127 talks about your children being a gift from the Lord. I could imagine Zechariah and Elizabeth thinking, man, why haven't we, why haven't we received this gift? At this point in the story, in Luke 1, that ship had already sailed. Right? Uh, uh, Elizabeth was barren, so she was not able to have kids. And then at this point in the story, she was already too old to have children. So that was, at this point, it was, there was no chance of that happening. On a personal level, what are you feeling hopeless about? It could be a baby, like, like Zechariah and Elizabeth. <clears throat> Maybe it's, maybe it's marriage. Maybe you are looking for a spouse. Right? Maybe, maybe marriage is something that you have desired for a long, long time. It just hasn't happened yet. And you're, you're thinking, man, I've been faithful. I've been trying to walk with the Lord. I've, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not perfect, but, but I'm trying to walk in, in a way that's, that's worthy of my calling. 
but I, I don't, I'm not married, right? Maybe, maybe that prayer, uh, that burden on your heart, that prayer request that you have, maybe, maybe it's a family member who doesn't walk with the Lord. Maybe it's a, it's a parent who does not walk with the Lord. Maybe it's a brother or a close relative who d- isn't walking with the Lord. And you just hope and pray for you. You may have been praying for years that the Lord would answer that prayer, that desire for them uh, to, 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 to be saved, for them to, to, to recognize Jesus as Lord. Right? Maybe, maybe it's a workplace tension. Or maybe you've been in a workplace scenario that is just kicking you in the tail. You maybe you just can't seem to get ahead at work uh, from the actual work. Maybe relationally, you're just having a hard time at work, and it's been something that you have been praying for for a long time, and the Lord has not answered that prayer. What are you feeling hopeless about? <clears throat> that is Zechariah. He is hopeless, and he probably wonders if the Lord even hears his prayers. But, this is crazy, but something is about to happen, which is going to lead Zechariah to proclaim a wonderful prophecy. The Lord's finally going to break his silence after 400 years. For now, though, let's pick up the story in, in Luke chapter 1. Verse 8. It's verses 8 through 17. Now, now, while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and, uh, and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. And fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Right, the, this is crazy, guys. The, 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 angel, the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah, and he said, Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. You're going to have a boy, and he's going to prepare the way for the Lord. He's going to bring the Messiah that you have been hoping for. All right, I could just imagine, man, I could just imagine Zechariah's heart pounding with a nervous excitement, right? A, a thrill of hope shot through him. When I was in college about 10 years ago, well, no, not 10 years ago. It was a little longer than that. <sighs> My college story is really complicated, guys, so when I make all these faces, it's just, where do I start? <clears throat> Um, long story short, when I was in, when I was uh, had finished my college years, uh, I I I left Illinois. Uh, when I was in Illinois, I left there uh, just a few hours short of getting my degree, and so it was this long process of trying to take the credits down here at UT, uh, UTB at the time and get them transferred back over to Illinois so I can get my degree. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, I wanted to do it. I needed to get my degree. I already took all my classes. It was just a matter of getting them 
you know, to sign off and say, yes, you're good. Here's your degree. Um, and so all I needed to do was, was take the classes, send my transcripts over to Illinois, and, and, and so I did that, right? Uh, I needed to transfer my classes over, and they denied the classes. And I was like, man, okay. Uh, and so my contact, the person who was helping me from Illinois, he was part of the, um, the staff there, and, and he was like, man, we just got to keep trying this. Eventually, hopefully, they, they, they see it through, right? You, you, you're able to, to graduate. So I was like, okay, fine. So we tried again, and it was denied, right? And then we tried again, and it was denied. And then we tried it a month or two later again, and it was denied. And this process went on for about a year. During that year, uh, I was starting to uh, be interested in my wife, Elise. I wanted to date her. And so I went to go talk to her dad. I was like, hello, sir. <laughs> How, uh, can I date your daughter, um, basically? And he's like, <clears throat> before, we, uh, before we do that, let's, uh, let's focus on you getting your degree. And so, like, there was, like, added pressure for me to, to graduate, right? So I was like, okay, come on, degree. So I continued to transfer uh, my – I continued to send the email, to submit the request, submit the request, and denied, denied, denied. And then finally, during uh, – Dece in December, about 10 years ago, I get an email. And it was from the university. And every time I got one of these, I, I, I was nervous. And so I opened it and said, congratulations, uh, your, you, uh, your, your credits have been accepted. You're going to receive your degree. And oh, my gosh. Like, man, my eyes started to water. Wasn't crying, right? <laughs> But my eyes started to water, and I was just completely taken back. And I, I told Lise, we were friends at the time, I told Lise, and she knew the trouble of me trying to get uh, my credits approved, and, and she, she was taken back also. Uh, but it was just such an emotional moment for me. A year, and that was just a year, one year of waiting, of trying, of knocking at this door, and it was finally answered. This prayer was finally answered, right? There was a spark that, 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 that shot through me, a thrill of hope. <laughs> Just to tie a bow on me and Elise. So I went back to her dad. I was like, hey, I got my degree. Like you said, can I date her now? And he's like, hey, man, I don't remember telling you that. I was like, all right. <laughs> so, but we are married now, so I guess, I guess it worked out for me, right? Um, <clears throat> but the angel Gabriel spoke to Zechariah. What does he say? He says, the Lord here has heard your prayers. Right? You will have a boy, and he will prepare the way for the Lord. You can just imagine the, the, the overwhelming just feelings that flushed through his body, right? Initially, though, initially he didn't believe, and as a result of that, he was unable to speak for nine months, right? So the Lord broke his silence after 400 years, right? He gives this man the prayer that he had been praying for a while at this point, and he gets this prayer, and he, he gets this prayer answered, and the Lord tells him he can't talk about it for nine months, and so he shuts his mouth and he doesn't allow him to speak. So my question again to us is, is, is what are your prayers? What are you praying for? What is your heart burdened by? Could you imagine your prayer finally being answered? The one that you've been wanting to be answered for a long time, and, and it's finally answered could you, could you imagine what that would feel like? And then could you imagine not being able to talk about it for nine months? My question is, what would you say when you were finally able to communicate? The words that we communicate, the words that we communicate reveal our hearts. Whether it's in prayer to God or in conversation, 
how we communicate the Lord's working in our lives reveals what we find most important. Now, as if the Lord were to answer these prayers for you, what would your answers sound like? Would your answers be mostly focused about you and how the Lord has answered your prayer? Or would the Lord be mostly focused about God and how God is faithful and how he is accomplishing his work? Let's look. Let's look at Zechariah's response. It's in, it's in Luke chapter 1. Um, it's at the end of the chapter. It's, it's verses 64 through 80. <clears throat> Verse 64 says, And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, he spoke blessing God, and fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the, the hand of the Lord is with him. Right? It says, verse 64, it's going to highlight again, his tongue was loosed. And he spoke blessing God. Verse 67 says, After his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. So this is Zechariah's prophecy. We've been talking about, and we're going to be going through different uh, songs and prophecies through our Advent series. And this is Zechariah's prophecy in response to what the Lord did in his life. And he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and, he, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets uh, from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Verse 76, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Man. So again, guys, this is Zechariah's response to what just happened. This, this nine months of silence from Zechariah. This is the first thing that comes out of his mouth. And what do we see? We see his heart. We see his hopes. And we see his desires in his response. Again, if, if you had waited, uh, uh, if you had a long-awaited prayer finally answered, what would you say? What did Zechariah say? The first thing it says, once he opened his mouth, he praised God. And then he went into the prophecy that we just read. Verses 67 through 75 were about God and him, him establishing his kingdom and, and him being faithful to his promises. He's praising God for who he is and what he is doing. And the second one, the second thing he prays about is about his son. And he's not even praying about his son like, Lord, thank you for a son. He's saying, like, thank you for the son who's going to point the way to Jesus. So what are you praying for? A child, marriage, a lost family member, workplace tension. I mean, fill in the gap, whatever it is, right? <clears throat> if the Lord were to answer this prayer, what would your response be? Would it be mostly about God or would it be mostly about you? 
The Lord hears our prayers. He knows our needs. Are our, are our prayers pointing to him? I believe that our prayers aren't answered because we aren't praying rightly. Now, I just want to say, like, this does not mean that I can get a jet or BMW or if you have a BMW, that's fine. But you get what I'm saying. It, it, it's not like a like a like a just to wish it and it appears right. I just want a bigger house. I want to met. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm not going to I'm not also I'm also not saying that the Lord is going to answer every prayer in the way that you want him to answer. But what I would say and what I venture to say is that the majority of our prayers aren't being answered because we're not asking rightly. James 4:2 says you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions we don't have because we are asking wrongly that's what james just tells us right? the things that we want the things that are burdening our hearts our desires are mostly for our own sake our own benefit so we can spend it on ourselves so what is the what is the ultimate reason behind your prayers? What is the ultimate reason? What is the driving force behind your prayers? Our prayers should be uh, pointing people to Jesus. Our prayers should point people to Jesus. Right? John, <laughs> John was pointing to Jesus, right? The fascinating thing about this story is that, that God wants to use our prayers, our answered prayers, our lives to point to Jesus. That is literally what John the Baptist was, right? He was someone who was preparing the way for the Lord. God answered his prayer, and the gift was literally to prepare people for Jesus. To, hey, I'm not the dude. This guy that's coming after me, he's the dude. That's the guy you need to follow. And, and this is crazy. In Zechariah's mind, he probably didn't associate his son with, with <clears throat> his desire for a son with his desire for the nation of Israel uh, uh, to, to be redeemed, to be saved. He probably didn't think those two things uh, uh, merged or, or meshed or, or were the same prayer. But it's crazy how the Lord used his, his personal desire to help also answer his, his, um, his vocational desire from what we talked about earlier. John 15, 7 through 9 says, <clears throat> if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you will keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. It says here, ask, abide in the Lord and ask whatever you want, and he will answer that prayer. Matthew 7, uh, 7 through 11 says, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. For everyone who asks, receive, and the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good, uh, heaven give good things to those who ask him? 
Our prayers should be pointing people to Jesus. Our desires, our motives behind our prayers should be so that the Lord accomplishes his work. So how should, how should we pray then? Again, these are some examples I just wrote down. Um, if, if, if one of these is not your burden, is not your prayer, that's fine. Um, insert whatever your burden is, whatever your prayer is. Um, <clears throat> so for marriage, it says, Lord, I've been praying for a marriage for a long time. Lord, if I am to be married, I pray that my marriage will point people to you. I pray that the marriage that I'm potentially going to be in would reflect you in every way. I pray that our marriage, the marriage I'm entering into, the marriage that I desire, Lord, I pray that it displays your steadfast love and your sacrificial love for the church, for the Lord's purposes, for your family. Lord, I pray that the family member who doesn't know you comes to faith in you, not so that I can be right, but so that they will find life in you. I pray that your kingdom grows because of their submission and their love for you. Workplace tension. Lord, I pray that the workplace environment would be more welcoming. It's been difficult for me to be at work, but it is the job that you have called me to. I pray that I'm able to grow in your image at my workplace. I pray that I can foster great relationships at work, not for my sake, not for my glory, but for your glory. I pray that people can come to know you, Jesus, through my relationships at work. And again, these are just examples, guys. But at the heart of it, it's for God's goodness. It's for God's uh, glory. It's for the advancement of his kingdom, more so or completely against the advancement of our own kingdom. Right? But as we read earlier, as, as we abide in the Lord, as our desires become his desires, and he was saying, uh, our, our scripture passage earlier was saying, ask for whatever you want and it will be given to you. We just need to ask rightly. And you may be thinking, and we'll, we'll end here, you may be thinking, man, I can't, I can't pray that way. I can't do that. I, I don't want to, to pray those thoughts. And I would say to us, I, I understand your rights. The beautiful thing about this, about this passage, and uh, the beautiful thing about us as Christians is that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. So the sin nature, the people who don't want to advance God's kingdom, that, that part in us, with, that part is dying. That part is, 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 is being put to death, and we have been made a new creation in Christ. Right, The old has passed away, and the new has come. Being a new creation in Christ, we've been filled with the Spirit to do what the Lord has called us to do. We can pray these prayers through our faith and our hope in Jesus, right? Let Christ work in us and let him work through us to bring people to know him. So I just want to say, guys, as, as we get through, as we, as we push through the rest of this holiday season, the things that you guys are burdened about, the things that you guys have hoped that the Lord would answer, the prayers that you hope the Lord would answer, um, I pray that you keep praying those prayers. And I, keep, and, I, and I pray, my hope for us is that as we pray for those prayers, or as we pray those prayers, as we pray for those things, right? we, we, we pray for those things in such a way that, that points people, that points those prayers, that points those requests, those, those burdens, and we pray those to give God the glory. May the gifts, may our prayers, may our requests, may our gifts that we received be used to point people to Jesus. Let's pray.
<clears throat> Lord, thank you for your just for your gifts, Lord, for every good thing that you have given us, Lord. Lord, I pray for those of us this morning who are hurting or maybe feeling a little bit hopeless like, like Zechariah was, Lord. I pray that we, um, pray that we see from this story that, that our requests, Lord, that our prayers should point people to you, Lord. Lord, our lives, the lives that we live, Lord, you have given us the gift of life, not for our sake, but so that we could be a blessing to others, Lord. I pray that as we go through this holiday season, we orient our minds uh, to, to think along those lines, Lord. How can the things that I'm praying for, how can my desires, how can the things that I want be used to point people to you, Lord? Lord, I pray as we go, uh, I pray that we, we just have just this desire to see your kingdom, your kingdom grow, Lord. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.